Welcome to the Plant Centered and Thriving Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Kitchens. Welcome to the show, Plant Centered Listener. My name is Ashley, and I am your host today. Imagine being diagnosed with a tumor, and in the height of 2020 quarantine, you are searching for answers. You are in pain, you don't feel well, you are truly a shell of yourself, and you're looking for anything. Well, this was Sunny, our guest today, her story, and she shares how after several doctor's visits, she finally found answers. And to her surprise, a lot of these recommendations from these different doctors were very similar. Sunny is a philosopher, she's a cat mom, a sometimes songwriter, and an aerial athlete. And her journey, like I said, began during 2020 quarantine. Her new lifestyle has become very beloved and near and dear to her heart, as you can imagine. And this lifestyle change has allowed her to not only regain her health, but also get back to her aerial journey, which she loves so much that had been interrupted from not only a severe foot injury, but also her illness. Please join me in welcoming Sunny to the show and her story. I know that you pivoted your diet a few years ago, so I would love to just jump into that and kind of learn more about what sort of caused that, you know, kind of change to start taking place. Yeah. So it's a bit of a long story. I'll try to keep the the beginning part brief. Um, so when I was living in Los Angeles, I was, um, I got diagnosed with like a small pituitary tumor. So I was diagnosed with a prolactinoma. It's a benign tumor that's on your pituitary gland, but it causes your pituitary gland to produce prolactin, which is a hormone that the body creates when you're lactating, when you're nursing. I have never been pregnant. So I actually had a partial hysterectomy when I, in my twenties from stage four endometriosis. So I don't know if the tumor is related to that, but yes. So that's what the tumor does. It causes your breast to swell. It causes weight gain, lethargy, and sometimes milk production, which I didn't get luckily, but it's pretty common. And they put me on a ton of really terrible medicine. It made me sick for a little while but then it got better. And so they're MRIing and making sure that it's shrinking. Uh, it has shrunk and I'm allowed to go off the medicine. I moved to London to do my master's degree. And in London, healthiest I've ever been in my life. I was not vegan. I was eating normally, quote unquote, typically, <laughs> but I was strong. I was healthy. I had tons of energy. And then I moved back to the United States and I'd say within six months, the tumor was back. So. American food, perhaps to blame. I don't know. I also had broken my foot at the time. So I was um, no longer moving like I did when I lived in London. I would walk miles a day um, and I was, you know, doing aerial as well in London. And so I was, you know, in very good shape, broke my foot, whole life kind of crashes in around me, tumor comes back. They want to put me back on this medicine, but I had had such a hard time with that medicine. I didn't want to go back on it. So I saw several doctors. I went to naturopaths and people who specialize in female hormones, all these things. And all of them said, go plant-based. Every single one of them, they wow. said, this is the answer. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I'm from Texas. And I had <laughs> been a vegetarian as a child because I do have a, a love for animals. So I had uh, tried it. But that was the 80s and there was nothing, no options. And my whole family didn't support me and I was a child. So I ended up malnourished because they would just make, you know, chicken and gravy and biscuits and stuff and yep. I would starve. Sounds so, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit being a vegetarian as a child. So I knew that I could do it, but I'd never done vegan. But I was already dairy free because I'm lactose intolerant since moving back to London or from London. No problem with milk in London, but as soon as I moved back, I started having trouble with milk. So I'd already gone dairy-free. I was kind of, you know, at the cusp. It's like, okay, it's basically just going vegetarian again because I've already cut out dairy. I told myself. <laughs> <laughs> so once we went into lockdown for COVID, I was teaching. So I started teaching online 
And I thought to myself, this is the perfect opportunity to try this vegan plant-based thing that all these doctors keep telling me about um, for the two weeks that we're locked down. And then if I, if my symptoms go away from this, the tumor, um, then I'll know they were right, but I doubt they will. I don't, you know, it's, this isn't going to help. You know, I was telling myself, um, instead after even maybe a week, my symptoms started reducing. And after the two weeks of being like very strict vegan during lockdown, I thought I don't want to stop. And we're still locked down. The lockdown kept getting extended, you know, and I thought I'll just keep going until we're, we're back. Cause as soon as we're back on campus, everyone's going to have donuts everywhere and all these things. But we, of course we didn't go back for gosh, a whole two semesters, I think, well, a semester and a half. So I just kept going and I just kept feeling better and better. Dropped like 20 pounds. They just fell off. And that I had gained that 20 pounds after I'd broken my foot. Um, my hair started growing back. I have very thin hair, but I had gone like, you know, I had like balding spots. They're coming back a little bit right now because I'm getting older. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it, my skin improved. It was remarkable. I'd never go back now. So yep. I went vegan kind of as an experiment and loved it. All my symptoms were gone. Now I have zero symptoms of this tumor. They still check me regularly to make sure it doesn't come back at the moment. It's great. I finally, after healing from the broken foot, was told it hadn't just been broken, that I had also torn a bunch of tendons. So I had to have surgery on the foot. So I was laid up even longer. One thing I noticed that really surprised me is that since being vegan, so I, you know, was doing this sport for eight years on and off with the foot. Will you explain what aerial is for no, those of us who may be unfamiliar with it? Um, it's mostly, some people will call it circus. So it's like silks or slings or lira, you'll see, or hoop. So all these things, these contraptions that hang from the sky that you then, you know, fold yourself around and over and fly around. Pole is the most common one that people know of as a, as pole fitness. I just do it as a, as a strength building exercise. And so I kind of cross train across all of the aerial apparatus. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it is so much fun. I get quite bored from working out. I do lift weights, but the whole time I wish I was in the air. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I had kind of stopped and started with aerial for a little while. And of course, was at my top peak in London, but it took me about eight months to get to get all my strength back. But then when I started again, being vegan, it took me like three months I got strong so fast and it just blew my mind because I'm not, you know, eating as much protein. Of perhaps. course, right. <laughs> um, I get plenty of protein, but it's, you know, probably not as much as I used to eat. And uh, I get, I build muscle faster. I recover faster. It's really amazing. I can't imagine ever eating meat again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was definitely harming me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and when you were talking to about your symptoms were going away, what kind of symptoms were you experiencing that once you changed your diet, you weren't experiencing anymore? Yes. Yeah, so, um, be, due to the tumor, I had very swollen, painful breasts and I had gained a ton of weight that I couldn't determine the reason for. I had broken my foot, like, you know, a year prior to kind of dealing with this again. Uh, lots of like acne, especially around my jaw. And I was losing my hair pretty bad. Like I had bald spots up through here. Every single one of those went away within uh, some of them early, some of them within two to three weeks of being vegan, but some of them a little later. Yeah. And I got the healthier hair than I'd had my whole life, which was always like a dream. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I've never had it this long before. It's all, it I always had to have it short because it was so thin. Yeah. So I mean, it's still thin, but at least it grows now. Yeah. Right. Right. What was like going through your mind as you were changing your diet, you're seeing your symptoms start to lessen or go away altogether. I mean, I mean, I just can't imagine like what was kind of, what was your thought process throughout all that? Oh gosh, it's been almost four years now. So I'm trying to remember, I'm, you know, living at home with my husband in quarantine at this time. 
Um, and he will never give up his burgers, even though I feed him vegan burgers that are better. But <laughs> So he's bringing home meat, right? But I am generally the person who does all the cooking. So the only time there was meat in the house is when he was bringing it home. And I would say to him, you know, I'm going to cook vegan meals for us. And that part was the the difficult part of the transitions. So I was pretty motivated and feeling good about it for the first, you know, week or so. It was tough, but not that difficult for me because I'm just that type of person. But after about a week, instantly, it felt like I was feel like I just woke up one day and I just felt better. I felt more energetic. I felt lighter. And so, of course, I'm telling my husband this, I'm like, gosh, I feel so much better. I wonder, you know, how the tumor is doing. I didn't really know that the tumor had reduced significantly until having the blood work done to show it. But I could tell because my breast start, stopped hurting. Um, I was dropping weight pretty quickly. I'd say within the first month, I lost like 20 pounds. In my mind, I'm thinking, all those doctors were right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way to live. You know, I must have been consuming all of these toxins and hormones. And it really changed my relationship with my body because I started seeing that, you know, generally when you have a health problem, it doesn't just happen to you. Uh, sometimes it does, but it's usually this culmination of what you've been putting into your body, how you've been moving. I should say I was not moving much at this time. So all that weight was falling off and I was just sitting on the couch teaching. So I just thought this is, this is magic. <laughs> so that was, you know, in my head, I was thinking, man, this was the right choice. I'm really excited. I did this and I don't know if I'll stick with it, but you know, it has really helped. And I think probably within two to four weeks, I thought, this is my life now and I'm happy about it. Wow. So it was really a physical and really mental and emotional change, huge change. And of course, as, as you know, because we all kind of went through it together, the world is at this time in this chaos of the pandemic and the quarantine. And I'm hearing all of these things about uh, people dying from it and having health problems from it. And I felt kind of guilty that I was kind of in like the best physical place I had been. And, you know, probably since before I got diagnosed with endometriosis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, you know, since my early twenties or something. So I still kind of think to myself that it was one of the best periods of my life and so terrible for everybody else in the world. And, and, you know, that is what it is, I guess. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I think that anyone can have this experience if they mm -hmm. make this choice. Yeah. And hopefully yeah. they don't have to do it in quarantine. <laughs> yes. Right. Exactly. Yes. That is a pretty interesting yeah. thing to note though, like where everyone else is, you know, we're living in fear. A lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people are dying from this. And here you are experiencing something of the total opposite where your health is becoming the best it had been in a really long time. Yeah. I even when I got COVID, it was really, I mean, I was vaccinated, but it was a really chill experience. I kind yeah. of had like a little bit of a cold a few days, got back up and at them. And I was reading, of course, that plant-based is one of the best ways to fight COVID. So even if you're not a plant-based person, if you get it, go plant-based quick um, for the length of the time that you're suffering. So um yeah, I feel like my health is just transformed. I'm 42. I shouldn't feel this good. <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I knock on wood, but like I never get sick. I don't get colds. Um, and I just imagine that my immunity must be pretty strong. Oh, from, yeah. Especially as a person who had kind of two like incredibly uh, serious illnesses. Um, like endometriosis was the worst he had ever seen, my doctor said, um, and survived all that. Then I got this weird tumor and now I'm kind of, you know, middle-aged and healthier than ever. It's quite strange. Yep. <laughs> but yep. No complaints. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I know a lot of people listening who have gone plant-based, even if they've gone plant-based later in life, a lot of people will say, this is the best I have ever felt. And it's a frustration. I'm kind of curious where you're at on this of one feeling like I've been lied to my whole life. Like, why didn't I do this sooner? Like this has totally impacted my health in a way that I never thought possible. And then on the other side, thank goodness I found this. I'm so grateful that I'm plant-based now versus like maybe never, never doing it or never taking that step to do it. And I imagine maybe, I don't know what they were like mixed emotions when you were starting that transition and feeling better too. I feel very grateful. Just like you said, that I found that I had these doctors kind of push me towards this, but I feel a little angry actually that our food production is so set up to harm us. And part of that comes from, I lived in England. Uh, the Brexit vote had happened, but Brexit itself hadn't happened. So we still had there all of the EU regulations on food. So I would pick up food like Ritz crackers, for instance. And I knew I all, not have always read nutrition labels, but I've been a nutrition label person long before I was vegan. And so I knew in the United States that the Ritz crackers had soybean oil and, and carrageenan and things like that. And so you'd pick up the same box, looks exactly the same in the UK. And it's like, wait, <laughs> What? <laughs> As opposed to all of these weird things you can't pronounce. Yeah, because they all of that's illegal over there. You can't have carrageenan in the food, for instance. That's one particular one that I know. Well, I say over there in the EU. Sure. Um, yep. England has now changed a lot because they Brexited. And now my friends over there say the food has gone down in quality a lot. But mm -hmm. at the time I lived there, it was great. When I moved back, I was paying more attention to things like dyes, um, carrageenan, soybean oil. Uh, GMOs and all that stuff. So I was already kind of like on the train of trying to get these things out of my life. But of course, meat is one of the, I guess, greatest sources of hormones that we have that we can consume. So it wasn't until I really made that change that I noticed a big difference in my health. But yeah, I think I still am quite angry at what's in our food yeah. oh you know i'm sure you have this experience you go to the store you're picking up something you're like why does this broccoli have milk in it <laughs> <laughs> broccoli <laughs> or whatever yep. you know uh -huh. everything has milk in it no but you're right i mean you make a really good point that our the society we live in here in the u.s it really isn't in most places set up to promote a healthful lifestyle in fact mm -hmm. it often does the opposite which is really unfortunate and it sounds like living in the EU kind of gave you a different perspective. And I think I saw something on social media and I can't believe everything you hear on social media, but I think it was a news clip. It was like a, uh, oh goodness, this, someone help me out if I'm misquoting this, but it was a country and not a country, like a city or something in Italy that was like the first city maybe to like ban synthetic foods of some sort. It was something related to that. And I remember just thinking like, wow, like wow, this, I mean, if this is the future that some places are headed, I mean, good for them for doing this now, because this is going to have a profound impact on the people that live there in those places. Yeah. They might become blue zones as we're saying. Yes. Yeah. 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 Which is basically just areas of clean eating. Yep. Uh, yeah. Clean farming, clean and humane, you know, animal consumption, if they are into that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, recently we saw that California is banning, I think it's red dye five, which of course there's another name for it that I can't think of a yep. chemical name and it's in Skittles, right? So of course I stopped eating candy a long time ago because uh, red of, because of dyes, but, um, but yeah, something like that also gives me the hope you just mentioned, which is like, oh, wow. Okay. So maybe people are, it's what I, I'm not a big fan of social media, same thing, because I feel like it can be, um, it can dehumanize us to each other. Uh, but it also helps us have more information, whether it's true information or not is another story. But people are becoming more aware of everything, including what's in their food. And I often wonder, you know, in the U EU, you know, healthcare is a standard for everyone. And so I wonder if it's like, well, we have to keep people from eating these things because we're the one who has to pay to take care of them. Good point. Whereas the United States is like, well, 
we don't care. I mean, in fact, it's great if people are unhealthy in the United States because more money for insurance, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think it's a problem of capitalism, sadly, but. Oh, the rabbit hole we could go down right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, as a philosopher, I could, I just mm-hmm. gave a lecture on Marx last, Marx last week. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I thought we could talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do uh, think, you know, I think about those things. And I think kind of like what you're saying, if more people were to think about the food that they're eating and kind of, if we were able to shift our demand towards these foods that truly nourish our bodies and also taste good, cause you have to have both. I think too often though, we lean into what just tastes good without thinking about what's also going to nourish me at the same time. Yes. I think that that was a, a big surprise for me in going vegan as well as I thought, Oh, well, I'm going to have to give up all these things that taste so good, but vegan food is delicious. It's the most delicious food I've ever had in my life when you're, you know, cooking it correctly and, um, using spices and my, even, you know, my partner who is not vegan, I'll, you know, cook for us these amazing vegan meals and he'll just be going amazing, excellent, (laughs) fantastic. (laughs) Way back when, when I was eating tofu. So I went plant-based in 2012 I cannot remember how old I was. It's like 11, 11 years ago. So like 26. Um, But tofu for some reason was so scary to eat because all I could think about was the salad bar tofu when I would go to the dining hall at college. And it was just like these like clumps of like silken tofu, probably that looked horrendous. And, but tofu now, if you know how to cook it is like the best thing ever. It has a bad rap. Yeah. I think. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I I kind of felt the same way about it. Or I was like, oh, so. oh, yeah. And I also, you know, coming from having female hormone issues, consuming soy was something that I was told to avoid for a long time. But um, I think I was conflating like hydrogenated soy protein or soybean oil with like edamame or tofu, which I can get organic and, you know, unpesticided. So now I consume a good amount of soy and it doesn't seem to be affecting my hormone. Well, it, it, it's on the positive, but <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> not the negative. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can have a protective so another, effect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's another reason soy or tofu gets a bad rep too is yes. the, the GMO soy warnings that we have seen. Mm-hmm. So it once you start, I think kind of, paying attention to what's in the things you're buying and consuming yeah so I I kind of find a lot of joy now in eating that I always found taste wise but now I find it in another way yes like it still tastes good but there's also this kind of like interesting joy of like being grateful knowing where it came from you know knowing it's not going to harm me I think we've forgotten what and put quotes around real, real food tastes like, because we're so used to eating these ultra processed foods that are literally designed to keep us coming back for more. And when we eat the, you know, freshly grown like strawberries or, you know, go pick our own strawberries or buy fresh fruit from the grocery store or, or more like fresh produce. Once you start eating more and more that you realize like, wow, this food does actually taste good. And I've been eating this other stuff that it still tastes good, but there's no nutritional value or very little. And it's again, just designed to keep me coming back for more and keep buying these products that aren't serving me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Even the, you know, like you said, the, the products that are natural, like a, you know, a pistachio, right. They're going to cover it in all sorts of oils and salts and things like that, that, create that addictive sensation in your brain like you know and you can't ever be perfect right it's just the effort of trying to kind of do your best and I think that that was something I had to learn too because I thought oh okay now I'd be a perfect vegan Sunny I'm curious too how with you being a philosopher how that how you also being vegan have those like have they overlapped at all kind of has one shaped your thought process and the other or vice versa it's a good question and I was a philosopher before I was a vegan, but at the time I was my primary my primary specialty was philosophy of race, um, and now I've kind of moved. I mean, I'm st- I still study that, but I've moved into ethics a lot more, 
And I don't know if it is part of this process. So I think a lot about um, animal ethics now that I, and environmental ethics, of course, that I was not as focused on before. There's especially a long history of philosophy as, and this comes from my philosophy of race studies. So there's an extolling of reason, right? And so only this certain group of people has reason and like women and people of color and animals don't have reason. So these groups get um, conflated, I guess, together with animals, right? And so I now present this conundrum to my students. It's like, well, obviously we know that women and people of color have reason. So do animals have reason? You know, so I kind of pose this question to them. We don't know. Uh, what we do know is that they make decisions, but many of the ones we eat are some of the smartest. So I kind of present this to my students. They know I'm a vegan. So I say, you know, obviously I'm not going to make you be a vegan, but just, just giving you some food for thought, some vegan food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it has really affected how I read all of these older uh, philosophical texts, which always, almost always belittle animals as not having reason. And so therefore we are more important extolling the human over all other species. And I think we've really gone wrong as a species to do that because it disconnects us from what we are, which is a part of nature. Yeah. And that's easy to disconnect from our food when we don't think of our food as also a part of nature or mm -hmm. should be. Philosophy is about you because you're already a philosopher, right? You're already asking questions about the world and your experiences. And so what philosophy does is gives you like tools of all the other people who have thought about these things so that you can think about them more deeply in different ways, maybe in like novel ways that no one else has done before. I just appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. And then also too, you know, sharing kind of your take with your background as well. I think it's always nice to hear um, just a different perspective. So I appreciate that and appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you as well. And I'm uh, so glad you had me on. Thank you for doing so. And I yeah. hope we get to talk some more. I want to hear uh, more about your personal story as well. I feel like I talked all about me, which I know is sort of the point, but <laughs> that's, yeah, that's pretty much the point, the main point. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, where can people connect with you online if they're interested in just learning more about you and your story and all those great things? Yes. I'm mostly on Instagram. Um, I'm entangled here, which is the name of a song I wrote as a young person. E-N-T-A-N-G-L-E-D-H-E-R-E. -E -E, so entangled here. Um, I put up aerial stuff and pictures of food all the time. <laughs> and I do have a website, sunnyheenan.com, but it's not up yet. That will eventually be my philosophy website. I just haven't bothered to design it since I'm still about a year in my PhD. So once I'm done with that, I'll actually become a real... An, uh, at least accredited philosopher. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we'll put those links in the show notes. So if you want to connect with Sunny, you can do that. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We appreciate you listening and hearing Sunny's story. Hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll catch you on the next episode. Until next time, keep thriving.